Chapter 2 Con Air The Con Air Boeing 727 took off from the landing strip near Crescent City, California and headed east. Two hours later, the plane touched down at Florence, Colorado, which was the home of the United States Penitentiary Administrative Maximum Facility, also known as ADX Florence, Florence Admax, Supermax, and the Alcatraz of the Rockies. It was an incredible super prison run by the federal government. It was where the Fed stashed some of the most deadly criminals in the world. ADX Florence was designed to inflict misery and pain. By comparison, one of Stalin's gulags was like a picnic in the park. The gulags worked you to death, starved you to death, and froze you to death. But at least there was other people around to talk to. The goal at ADX Florence was to bore you to death, isolate you, and drive you insane. In ADX, there was no human contact. As he entered ADX Florence, U.S. Marshal Clarence Sugar felt a tingle up his spine. An inquisitive, an eerie quiet invaded his ears. For a moment, he felt like he was totally alone, the last living man in the world, made entirely of poured concrete. A wave of paranoid claustrophobia curled around him, sucked at him. They looked a little green around the edges. Up ahead, a federal correctional officer appeared as if out of nowhere. The CO was tall and burly, with short cropped hair and carried a clipboard. Marshal Sugar said, asked the CO, extending his hand. Sugar shook his hand. Yes, we're here to pick up and transport four AB members, interrupted the CO. I know. We're glad to get rid of them, especially under the circumstances. What do you mean? asked Marshal Sugar. The indictment for murder, smiled the CO. They're all guilty as hell. Most of them should have been executed a long time ago. Marshal Sugar nodded. The man was right. If it wasn't for smart attorneys and appeals and delaying motions and a court system that moved at a geologic pace, most of the inmates here would be dead and buried. But Marshal Sugar didn't like the CO's tone of voice, which implied prejudice and judgment, which was not professional. The guy's job was to follow the rules, obey the laws of the land, respect the rights of the inmates as defined by the courts, and keep him pace in prison. Just like Marshal Sugar's job was to transport criminals and make sure it was done in a safe manner. None of them are aware that they're being moved, said the CO. They've all eaten, so you don't need to worry about feeding them for a while. Okay, replied Marshal Sugar. He turned his face to his deputies. We we'll use five-man teams, one team per prisoner. Everybody be alert. These guys are maximum hazard, added the CO. Every one of them has killed and they like it. Watch your asses. Marshal Sugar rolled his eyes to the ceiling but said nothing. John Youngster Stinson, Richard Bart Simpson Turflinger, Bob Blinky Griffin, and Ronald McCool Slocum weren't used to guess, much less U.S. Marshals strapped for action. The four Aryan Brotherhood members stayed in their cells 23 hours a day. Their only human contact occurred when the CO delivered food trays through a slot in their doors. The CO was under orders to speak only when necessary, which was rarely. Once a day, never at the same time, each of the electronic doors would open, allowing the occupant one hour of exercise in a rectangular cage. But today something was up. John Stinson figured it was a cell shakedown and strip search until he noticed the black fatigues with U.S. Marshal patches on the shoulders and the unfamiliar faces. He smiled to himself. Things were looking up. His routine was so bland, you couldn't even call it a routine. So any change in it was welcome. Once Stinson realized he was being transferred, he didn't mind the goon squad. He didn't complain, didn't struggle, didn't spit, didn't call anybody ninja, cocksucking, faggot, punk. He was cooperation itself because the view was about to change. They escorted him to a van with four marshals and one driver. He had seen McCool surrounded by black clad marshals standing beside another van. Stinson gazed out the windows, smiling hugely. He felt like he was off for a barbecue at the beach. Instead, they drove him to an airport and escorted him onto a waiting jet. As he shuffled his shackled legs along the plane's center aisle, he saw two men, Barry Mills and Hulk Bingham. He never thought he'd see them again as long as he lived. Baron, he shouted, expecting the marshals to punch him for calling out. The Baron turned in his seat and smiled. Yo, youngster, how's it hanging? Things are looking up. 
answered Stinson, laughing. He looked back, surprised that one of the marshals hadn't hit him. One of the marshals put a finger to his lips. Shh, he said. This is a no-talking flight. Stinson nodded. That's cool, man. That's cool. They put him in a seat and triple cuffed his hands. Stinson heard shackles clanking and more shuffling behind him. Looking over the back of his seat, he saw Turflinger, Griffin, and McCool being escorted on the plane. Most of the members of the Aryan Brotherhood had nicknames, usually assigned by other members because of some personality quirk or a resemblance to a movie or a cartoon character. Nicknames provided a sense of belonging to the group since only the in people knew the nicknames. Members used the nicknames almost as a term of endearment. It was a way for men who claimed they had no need for love or affection to camouflage their feelings. Of the four men, Stinson and McCool were the most dangerous, but all four believed that murder was a viable and effective problem-solving device. All four had killed since entering the prison system years ago. Originally, Stinson and McCool were bank robbers. Turflinger and Griffin smuggled drugs and ran guns, along with occasional extortion, just for fun. At one point, from his cell in the LA County Jail, Stinson controlled a huge drug consortium on the outside. One of the marshals, a big guy who looked like he could take care of himself, stood up in front and said, Okay, as I'm sure you figured out by now, you guys are being transferred. I can't tell you where you're going because I have orders not to, so please don't ask. He looked around the plane. If you're good boys, you'll be treated with respect. You respect us, we respect you. That's the way it works here on Con Air. He smiled a little. But if you fuck up, there are consequences. We will gag you and immobilize your hands. Marshal Sugar glanced around. We have more passengers who will be joining us. Sit back and enjoy the flight. Con Air took off and turned south. A few hours later, it landed just outside Beaumont, Texas, and was met by 12 deputy marshals from Houston, 100 miles to the east. The extra marshals would babysit the criminals already on board, while Marshal Sugar and his deputies drove to the maximum security penitentiary and picked up more bad guys. Of the 40 Aryan Brotherhood members named in the federal indictment, a baker's dozen of them were warehoused at USP's Beaumont, which, besides being home away from home for 10 different prison gangs, had the added attraction of its location right in the middle of the flattest hottest and most humid places on earth. Rafael Gonzalez Munoz was one of the 13 members that the marshals would collect from U.S. Beaumont, a vicious killer. Munoz originally ruled over a vast kingdom in Mexico. He was one of the leaders of La M, the Mexican Mafia. Always seeking to expand his empire, Munoz had moved his operation into Southern California, Arizona, and Texas. One of Munoz's talents was prophecy. He could see trends. Like the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, he knew when it was time to restructure his business. While others reacted, he acted. He made the switch from marijuana to cocaine at just the right time. Then he got out of cocaine and focused on methamphetamine before anyone else even thought about it. His hero was Al Pacino in the movie Scarface. Munoz wanted to be just like him. When rival gangs tried to move in on his territory, Munoz didn't hesitate but responded with raw violence. He had thousands of Mexican Mafia soldiers who obeyed his orders. No one and nothing stood in his way. The DEA tripped him up, surrounding one of his warehouses in Corpus Christi. Munoz and his homies decided to shoot it out with the feds. Amped up on crystal, holding an AK-47 assault rifle, Munoz rained lead. Unfortunately for Munoz, the feds were a better shot and he was hit in the shoulder and thigh. Rafael Gonzalez Munoz was found guilty by jury of seven RICO violations, including second-degree murder and attempted murder. The judge gave him 30 years to life and threw him into USP Beaumont to think about the error of his ways. Repentance was for pussies, and Munoz didn't think about it. Instead, he negotiated an alliance with the Aryan Brotherhood. Seeing a trend, he figured it was easier to join them than fight them. According to Munoz, these white dudes knew how to take care of business. They had connections, muscle, labs, everything, man. Munoz was unsure the Brotherhood would ally with them. He was Mexican Mafia, which meant he was Mexican. Definitely not white, like the Aryan Brotherhood, who were supposed to be white supremacists. 
but something funny happened. It turned out the Aryan Brotherhood used to be about white power and all that shit. They weren't anymore. Now they were about supremacy, pure and simple. They would do whatever it took to keep them on top. Even hitch their honky horse to a Mexican gang. The Mexican Mafia and the Aryan Brotherhood hooked up, doing favors for each other. A favor was a hit, a contract murder. Munoz had some enemies and some defectors in California prisons he wanted to bleed. The Brotherhood was pleased to oblige. In return, Munoz provided drugs and tax money to the Brotherhood. And if the Brotherhood needed a favor, Munoz's homies took care of it. The Aryan Brotherhood took to calling Munoz Cisco because they thought of him as a sidekick like Cisco was to Pancho in the old Mexican Western on television. U.S. Marshal Clarence J. Sugar stood at ease, watching as his deputy marshals loaded the 13 bad guys from U.S. Beaumont on the bus. Specially fitted with individual reinforced cages for the confinement of his passengers, it was jail on wheels. The property of U.S. Marshal Service and delivered to the airport by the Houston deputy marshals who were babysitting the plane and his high-profile passengers. The bus was heavily armored with black bulletproof glass windows. The vehicle could sustain anything short of a light anti-armor rocket. Each prisoner was escorted onto it by four deputy marshals. Once the prisoner was seated and locked in his cage, the next prisoner was let out. Marshal Sugar glanced at the bus and smiled. He said to one of his deputies, It's the only way to go RVing. Yes, sir, replied the deputy. Why stay home when you can vacation in style? Marshal Sugar laughed and nodded. Across the way, he saw the last prisoner being escorted. That's number 13, right? He asked the deputy. Yes, sir. The deputy glanced at his clipboard, Rafael Gonzalez Munoz. The man doing the shackle shuffle toward the bus was small and lean. He didn't look much like an international drug lord, thought Marshal Sugar. He looked more like a nerdy college student who couldn't get a date and had low self-esteem. Marshal Sugar shrugged. Okay, once he's secured, double check the count and let's get out of here. We still have one stop left, then a long flight back to LA. Yes, sir. Con Air flew north. It carried 19 brutal passengers who sat with triple handcuffs and shackled legs and 20 marshals who appeared relaxed but who noticed everything. Marshal Sugar stood in front of the convicts. Meals will be served. Your hands will be single cuffed so you can eat, but only for a few minutes and only three at a time. Because of your improvisational skills and your zeal, the meals, sandwiches and chips, no utensils and only paper cups. All the paper cups and napkins would be accounted for. If anyone's cup was missing, that man would be strip searched, gagged and immobilized. Marshal Sugar didn't believe threats worked with these men, so he didn't waste his breath threatening them. How do you threaten a man who's been in solitary confinement for years? Quiet conversation with your neighbors will be allowed from this point on, added Marshal Sugar. We'll be picking up more guests, then we'll be on our way. Where are we going, asked Hulk Bingham. Marshal Sugar shook his head, indicating he couldn't say. Who's the last guest? Marshal Sugar looked at the Hulk. Before he could say, he couldn't say. Barry Mills, the Baron, cut in. Wrong question, Hulk. What you should ask yourself is this, who's missing? Mills continued, the only one missing who's not already in Southern California is Tom, which means we're on our way to Kansas, then to Los Angeles or San Diego, probably LA. A smile touched Mills' lips, but not his eyes. His eyes remained flat and hard, like black holes that had collapsed in on themselves. Yeah, it's gotta be Tommy, he drawled then closed his eyes and leaned his shaved head back. Thomas Silverstein was America's most dangerous prisoner. His nickname was Terrible Tom. The doctor thought for a moment, then said, I'd call him a psychosocial killer. Murder is the way he makes love to other human beings. It's like sex for him. Silverstein wasn't Tom's real name. His real name was Thomas Conway Jr. He grew up in Long Beach, California and he hated coming home from school every day because his mom and his dad fought like two cats in a bag. His parents considered screaming and slapping, punching and kicking, throwing dishes and demolishing doors normal behavior. Socially, Tom was a catastrophe that kept on happening. Timid Tom would have been an appropriate nickname for the young Tommy. He was shy and withdrawn. 
He didn't fit in at school and he had no friends, only enemies who were bullies and saw easy pickings in on Tom. To cap it all, everyone thought he was Jewish, which made him more of a pariah than he already was. Every day he came home from school, either frightened or beat up, some days both. His mom called him Tragic Tom because she said, your life reminds me of one of those Greek tragedies where everybody walks around wretch saying, woe is me. One day he arrived home crying. What's the matter? asked his mother, setting down her cigarette to take a sip of Virginia tonic. She had intended to do some cleaning that day, but fixed herself a drink instead. One drink led to another, and pretty soon she didn't feel like cleaning. She switched on television and lit a Chesterfield. With blood oozing from the corner of his lip and a bruise on his cheek, Tom just looked at the floor and sniffled. You pathetic little crybaby, yelled his mother. Tell me what happened or I'll give you something to really cry about. I, I got hit, said Tommy, starting to whimper. Did you fight back? No, whispered Tommy. What did you do, you little wimp? He had run, but Tommy couldn't swear because his mother would hate him. You ran, didn't you, you little piece of shit, screamed his mother. Tommy began bawling. He tried not to, but he couldn't stop it. His mother leaned forward, taking a huge puff on her cigarette. Look at me, cry baby, she commanded. Smoke curling from her nose to her mouth. Look at me. Tommy looked up. His mother's face was sharp. Next time you come home crying because some boy beat you up, she paused for another long drag on her cigarette. I will whoop you myself. Two beatings instead of one, she snarled. Tommy wiped his nose on his sleeve. I'm sorry, mother. I'm so sorry. Get out of my sight, you sissy, she hissed. You make me sick. Tommy ran to his room where he collapsed on his bed, curling up like a fetus. He sucked his thumb and cried himself to sleep. No one came to check on him. No one called him for dinner. Tommy was 11 years old. Years later, terrible Tom Silverstein recalled, that's how my mom was. She stood her mud. If someone came at you with a bat, you got your bat and you both went at it. Tom's sister, Sydney, said, we were taught never to throw the first punch, but never walk away from a fight. My brother started getting into trouble because he was running away from a violent environment at home. Then he got into drugs and he became a brother I never knew. Three years later, age 14, Tom Silverstein was sent to a California reform school. In 1966, reform school was a nice Nellyism for gladiator school because the only subject he taught was violence and the learning process was unsentimental and hands-on. Tom came away with the nuts and bolts approach to brutality. Like a wolf in the coldest of winters, Kill or Be Killed became Tom's slogan, his religious song. But a wisp of humanity remained. Starved for affection and approval, Tom wanted to feel plugged in. He wanted to connect with other human beings. So he started hanging out with his real father, Tom Conway Sr., who used people until they were of no more use. Then he brushed them off and moved on. Tom Sr. robbed banks, at least that's what he told people. In truth, Tom Sr. was a petty thief and not a very good one, he was a wannabe. When the two Conways hooked up, they spurred each other on. Tom Sr. told bigger lies about himself and his accomplishments. He even gave advice to his son on how to be a bank robber. Tom Jr listened carefully, and then applied what he learned from his old man. Dropping out of school, Tom made a choice. He became a professional criminal. He started out small, hitting convenience stores and corner gas stations. Sometimes he got away with only a few bucks. Other times, he made hundreds of dollars. Whatever the amount, he split down the middle with his old man. Although Tom Jr. was doing all the work, taking all the risk, they were a team, and Tom felt a loyalty to his blood father. Things were looking up. It went to hell in 1971 when Tom Jr. was 19 years old. Walking into a 7-Eleven store on a Friday night when there would be lots of cash in the till, Tom stuck his gun to the cashier's face. Take all the money from your drawer and put it in the paper bag you ordered. Sure, man, said the cashier. Just don't shoot me, man, okay? The cashier groped at the money, jamming it in the bag. Then he handed it to the robber. Tom pointed his gun at the guy's nose. Say anything to the cops and I'll make it my business to come back and kill you, he stated and then left. The cashier didn't say anything. He didn't have to. 
Surveillance cameras caught the incident on tape and Tom was quickly identified by the cops. A warrant was issued and the hunt was on. Tom Conway Jr. was arrested the next afternoon as he left a hamburger joint. Tom had a thing for chocolate and a cheeseburger and a chocolate malt helped soothe the beast within him. The cops cuffed him and carted him off to jail. Tom's public defender advised him to cop a plea. If you take this to trial, you need to find a new lawyer, the public defender told him, because I won't be part of any legal suicide. Because of the surveillance tape from the 7-Eleven, he reminded Tom, they got you dead to rights. Fuck you, replied Tom. Fuck you, replied Tom. But he knew the lawyer was right, and so he copped a plea bargain. He pled guilty and in return was promised a reduced sentence, which meant 3 to 10 years instead of 10 to 15. They shipped him off to San Quentin prison. Being a new fish at San Quentin was like dying and going to hell, only this particular hell wasn't divided into levels based on sin. The hell was that the Q divided itself on skin color, blacks over there, whites over here, and Hispanics over yonder. It was not surprising and Tom had experienced racial bigotry while in grade school where everyone thought he was a Jew, which meant he was like a kike, which meant he was less. One good thing about the Q though, nobody cared if he was Jewish or not. They just cared if he was white or black or brown. And Tom figured out real fast that if he wanted to survive, he needed to hook up with the gang and he didn't marry into a white gang. On the yard one day, Tom met a big white guy with a shaved head and muscles on his muscles. Tom was on the bench press struggling to get one final rep when two hands the size of hams helped him get the bar up and racked. Tom sat up wiping his forehead with the tail of his t-shirt. Thanks man, he said. I was about to drop that fucker on my chest. Would not have been pretty. Tom stood up. The big guy laughed. Leave a big dent in your chest, he boomed. Mind if I work in? He asked. Without waiting for an answer, he grabbed two 45-pound plates from a nearby stack. Sleeving them on the bar, he reached for two more and put them on. Then he slid on the bench and gripped the bar. That's more than 400 pounds, said Tom. Yep, the guy racked the bar off and did 10 reps easy. Jesus, Mary Joseph, exclaimed Tom. You're strong as an ox. Moose, said the guy. Well, I guess so, agreed Tom. Mooses are pretty strong, too. The guy gave Tom a funny look. Moose is my name, Moose Forbes. All right, Moose got up and added two more plates to the bar. New fish, huh, he asked Tom. Tom nodded, got three to 10 for armed robbery. Moose wasn't impressed, you hooked up? No, said Tom, I want to, but I don't know what the protocol is. Moose squinted at him. You know, the protocol, the correct way of going about it, explained Tom. Moose laughed, shaking his head. You talk like a college boy, where are you from? Long Beach, and I ain't no college boy. That a fact, said Moose, baring his teeth. That ain't Long Beach, it's the queue. And there ain't no protocol, cause there ain't no applications to fill out. It ain't no fucking country club, college boy. Tom took a step back. He gazed at Moose and waited. Moose couldn't believe it. Did this little fuck know who he was? If he wanted a dog fight, he'd come to the right dog. Moose loved the shit. Moose took a step forward. As if by magic, a shift gleamed in Tom's hand. Tom stood waiting, Moose charged in his arms reaching out. Tom slipped to the side. As Moose passed by, the shift licked out and kissed his ribs. Moose pulled up and turned to look at Tom, and then lifted his shirt to look at his ribs. Blood welled from a six inch gash in his side. Pulling his shirt down, pulling his shirt down, Moose glanced around. The other inmates were going about their business, talking, pumping iron, laughing, smoking. It happened so fast no one had noticed. Moose stared at Tom for a moment, then turned and walked away. Tom shrugged and went back to lifting weights. The next day, a guy who called himself Spots waved Tom over. Because of his many tattoos, Spots looked like a leper. Spots told him that the Aryan Brotherhood had accepted him as a prospect. The who, asked Tom. He'd only been there a week. He didn't know the names of all the gangs. Spots did a double take. Shit, man, he said. You know, the brand. Tom shrugged. Never heard of him. Spots rolled his eyes. Fuck me, man. The brand runs the place. Drugs, guns, pruno, all of it. If you say so, what do they want with me? 
and reaching out, man. Explain spots. You know, you can hook up. Be part of the brotherhood. No one will fuck with you. And if they do, the brotherhood got your back. Tom thought about that. Sure. What do I have to do? Spot smiled. Nothing. Everything. Whatever they tell you. After you earn your bones, you're in. Spots clenched his fist in front of his chest. Okay, said Tom. Spots nodded in approval. You'd be sponsored by Moose. He'd be telling you what's what. Okay, Spots walked off. Tom learned that Moose, rather than being pissed off, was impressed with Tom's fury and willingness to jump in the shit. Blood in, blood out. Tom had already spilled Moose's blood, so Moose had sponsored him, telling the Aryan Brotherhood that the little fucker's faster than Grease Lightning. Within a year, Tom had taken the pledge and was branded. Being branded was okay with Tom because he knew it was a rite of passage. It was expected. He'd read about it. Ancient warriors like the Babylonians and the Sumerians would mark themselves with the blood of their enemies. Tom enjoyed the camaraderie he found in the Aryan Brotherhood and he appreciated the protection it provided, but he never got the rush from it like others did. Most of them were adrenaline junkies who loved the idea of terror and power. Their drug of choice was violence. Being in the toughest prison gang gave them an emotional high, a kind of exalted state, where they believed they were invincible mystical warriors of some pagan religion. In Tom's opinion, the mystical warrior stuff was bullshit. Tom simply wanted respect. He didn't hate violence. He didn't love violence. He found it inevitable. To get respect, sometimes he had to become violent. That's just the way it was. Tom spent four years at the Q, then the powers that be paroled him, and he once more hooked up with Tom Sr., who had hooked up with Tom's uncle, Arthur. Nervous and skinny with lank hair and bad personal hygiene, Arthur was in the nose candy, cocaine, and needed lots of cash to pay for his habit. Arthur thought of himself as a badass and loved playing the part. He had a regular arsenal of guns in his trashy apartment on the third floor of a rent subsidized complex along with a freaky girlfriend who mainlined heroin and a Siamese cat that Arthur always forgot to feed. Tom didn't think much of the whole arrangement. In his opinion, Uncle Arthur was a goof, but he went along with it because it was family. Dad said they had to stick together, so they did. They hit three convenience stores over the course of three weeks. Tom insisted on masks because of the surveillance cameras that had tripped him up once before. Only Arthur didn't want to wear a mask. Arthur used his nose to suck up copious amounts of coke rather than for breathing and consequently he spent a lot of time writhing and twitching in paranoia. Wearing a mask gave him extreme claustrophobia which gave him the heebie-jeebies and left him gasping for air. It didn't work out well at all. The cops identified Arthur who then followed him around for a few days making up a list of his known associates. These included Tom Jr., Tom Sr., and a young female who looked like death warmed over, according to one of the cops. After the third robbery, the cops moved in and arrested everybody, recovering most of the stolen cash. The trial was a fiasco. Twitchy Arthur couldn't keep his mouth shut. He was going through withdrawal and was more paranoid than ever. Pale and sweating, he rolled over on his nephew and brother without really meaning to. Tommy was the leader. We just did as he told us, chirped Arthur. Me and his dad was just taking orders. Tommy's a smart boy. He was the brains. Arthur got five years in prison. Tom Sr. got five to seven years in prison. And Tom Jr. got 15 years. He was 23 years old. The Fed shipped Tommy off to Leavenworth, which was a maximum security prison in Kansas. Because of its heat and humidity, Leavenworth was called the hothouse. 